Greetings, my loves. My name is Jasmine Brantley of Inspire Me Jazzy, as well as the fabulous ladies of Inspire Me Jazzy. And I am back before you once again as we continue this amazing yet extremely challenging journey to health and wholeness through our Bible reading plan entitled, Do You Want to Be Made Whole? Hear me, before we go any further, I just want to take a moment to say thank you for joining me. Whether you are watching these videos live or watching the replay, I appreciate every view, every comment, every share, every like, every private message, every phone call expressing how God is using this particular plan to impact your lives. I do not at all take that lightly and I genuinely bless the name of the Lord for it. You see, I realize that healing is hard. I realize that healing is a process. I realize that healing is uncomfortable, but I have to applaud you because healing is a choice and it's clearly a choice that you have made. So I salute you and I pray that this plan continues to serve as a blessing to you as we continue to press right on through. With that being said, let's get to it. We are 10 days in, which means that I am here with my feedback for day nine's assigned reading entitled, Will I Recover from This Injury? Coming from the book of 2 Kings chapter one. Now for the purposes of today's lesson, I will not be dealing with the entire chapter. I will only focus on a couple of verses, but I strongly encourage you to read the chapter in its entirety if you have not already done so. Now, in yesterday's assigned reading, we were dealing with a man by the name of Ahaziah. And what's key and critical to know is that King Ahaziah is the son of an extremely wicked king by the name of King Ahab, who reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Now, after this king's death, a nation that had been subject to them, Moab, now rises up against them, which seems to further indicate how bad things had gotten in the nation of Israel. Because historically, the same nation had been used as an instrument of judgment against the people of God when they walked away from God. Now, King Ahaziah reigns two years over Israel, and he does evil in the sight of the Lord. And it says he continues in the ways of his father and of his mother, which was Queen Jezebel. Now, just in case we need an understanding of why this is such a bad thing, let's take a closer look at his father and his mother, which were both extremely evil. They both practiced idolatry. They worshiped other gods. King Ahab set up altars and images to worship these gods in Samaria. Scripture tells us that King Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all of the kings before him. In addition to that, Queen Jezebel, his mother, is known for slaughtering, eliminating, murdering the prophets, the spokesmen, the representatives of the Lord being extremely controlling and stirring up evil in her husband, who was the king of Israel. Now, I want to take a moment to deal with this briefly because as I mentioned yesterday, for those of you who were able to join us for Bible study, as we take this journey of healing and wholeness, it's extremely important that we deal with the realities of what may be present in our lives and in our bloodline. But before I deal with this, I want to share with you what I shared with his sons and daughters on yesterday. I want us to read these stories, right? I want us to deal with the realities of the assigned readings. But after we break down what has actually taken place in scripture, I really want us to focus on the emotions, the behaviors, the experiences themselves so that their story becomes relatable to our story. Because listen, if the goal is to heal for real, we have to deal with these symptoms in our own lives. We have to identify these cycles in our own families. We have to be honest with ourselves concerning the presence of some of these things in our own hearts because we can't deal with what we are unwilling to admit is present. We can't do the work to heal in areas that we don't even realize we're sick in. We can't break cycles when we have failed to recognize them. 
So hear me clearly. I really want to use this time. I really want you to use this time as a time of self-reflection to really evaluate what is present in you and or in your bloodline. But as you are honest with you about what's in you and or in your bloodline, I'm, I'm asking that you refrain from judging you and or your family, from condemning you and or your family, from blaming you and or your family, from pronouncing a sentence up on you and or your family that God has not given out. The purpose of this is to simply run the necessary tests, do the necessary evaluations so that the doctor can show you clearly those things that aren't easily exposed otherwise. So yesterday during Bible study, we dealt specifically with sibling rivalry, deception, envy, and hate. But today, I want to take a moment to deal with idolatry, murder, and control. Idolatry is defined by Webster Dictionary as a moderate attachment or devotion to something. A moderate is defined as exceeding just, usual, or suitable bounds. Attachment is defined by Oxford languages as affection, fondness, or sympathy for someone or something. Synonyms for this word include, but are not limited to, bond, devotion, loyalty. Devotion is defined by the same source as love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or a cause. Synonyms for this word include, but are not limited to, faithfulness, commitment, allegiance, admiration, and dedication. The Bible Dictionary by Tom Nelson defines idolatry as the worship of something created as opposed to the worship of the creator himself. So finally, let's look at the word worship, which is defined by Oxford languages as the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. So if I had to create a definition based off of the information given. I would define idolatry as anything or anybody that we express or possess an undue, unwarranted, unjustified amount of adoration, devotion, or submission to. It is when we are expressing with our words and or with our actions that which rightfully and only belong to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, anything that we obey over him, anything that we think about, dream about, talk about more than him, anything that we give more of ourselves to than him, anything that we give his credit, his glory, his worship, his praise to is an idol. So the question becomes, do you have an idol in your heart and or in your life? Does idolatry run in your bloodline? Do you have a history and or a tendency to yield to the voice of people and or yourself over the voice of the most high God? Do you have a history and or a tendency to place the people, places, and things that he has gifted you with in a position of priority over him? Do you have a history and or a tendency to worship other gods? Does the worship of other gods run in your bloodline? Is there a history and or a tendency to seek healing? Direction, attention, peace, comfort in anything independently from God. What do you have an unhealthy attachment to? Who do you feel like you literally cannot breathe, move, progress forward if they left you, if they died tomorrow, if something happened, you would not know what to do that is not God. What do you think about excessively that is driving your movement, hindering your obedience, possessing power over you that is absolutely unreal? Is idolatry present in your heart, in your bloodline, or in the lives of your children? Second thing I want to deal with is murder. Murder is defined by Oxford languages as the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. 
Killing is defined by the same source as an act of causing death, especially deliberately. While death is defined by Webster as a permanent cessation of all vital functions, the end of life it is the cause or occasion of a loss of life. So the question becomes, do you have a history and or a tendency to kill? Does murder, whether physically and or spiritually, run in your bloodline? Do you have a history and or a tendency to use physical force to injure people? Do you have a history and or a tendency to physically abuse people? Are you or were you a bully? Do you possess the characteristics of someone who has the potential to kill, to murder another individual? Are you hot-headed, heartless, aggressive, full of anger? Where have you caused a loss of life? Where have you caused something and or someone to cease living? Does murder, violence, anger have a presence in your life, in your bloodline, and or in your children? Finally, control. Control is defined by Oxford languages as the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. Webster defines it as to ex exercise restraining or directing influence over while Oxford defines influence as the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something, or the effect itself. So, the question becomes, do you have a history and or a tendency to maintain control, to attempt to maintain control concerning what happens in your life and or in the lives of others? Does manipulation run in your bloodline? Do you have a habit of speaking in a certain way, behaving a certain way, making certain moves, wearing certain facial expressions in order to get that which you desire? Do you have a tendency to strategize, strategize in detail how you can work things out in your favor? Do you feel like you are losing your mind when there seems to be nothing you can do to change a situation, to control the impact that a situation actually has? Does the desire for control, the habit of manipulation, have a presence in your heart, in your bloodline, or in your children's lives? Back to the text. So this king, the product of two individuals that absolutely operated in these three things, they are he is now carrying the to torch, carrying on their legacy, walking in their footsteps accordingly. But the text also says that he continues in the footsteps of a previous king by the name of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger according to all that his father had done. So with all of this being said, this is who we are dealing with in yesterday's reading. A man who was a descendant of wickedness, immorality, unrighteousness, currently operating in evil, wickedness, immorality, unrighteousness, and leading the people of God to do the exact same. So, 2 Kings chapter 1. And like I said, I'm only going to deal with verses 2 through 5 and I will be done. Verse 2 reads, Now Ahijah fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. So this is what happens, right? This, this king falls through the lattice which Webster defines as a framework or structure of crossed wood or metal strips, okay? So he falls through the lattice of his upper room, which is called a, a roof chamber or a roof room. Now, based on my research, it seems that this would kind of be similar to an attic, right? So as a result of this fall, the text says that the king was injured. Injured in the Hebrew means to be or become weak, sick, diseased, grieved or sorry. Webster defines injury as hurt, damaged, or loss suffered. 
So it seems that the king found himself in a position where he was severely hurt. And, and we don't know for sure, but with our knowledge, when a person falls from a higher place to a lower place, then you begin to think along the lines of someone now being disabled, right? Having broken or fractured bones, maybe being paralyzed, someone who is physically handicapped in some way, right? Well, the king of Israel sends messengers on his behalf to a false god by the name of Beelzebub, which is a Philistine deity worshiped in a place by the name of Ekron. And he does so to inquire, to ask, to find out whether or not he would recover, whether or not he would be restored to health from this injury. Verse three, but the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? The NLT version of this reads, is there no God in Israel? Why are you going to Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, to ask whether the king will recover? Hear me, in other words, you are on the throne of my kingdom, leading my nation, but you fail to even consider coming to me concerning your injury, your sickness, your pain? Really? Verse four. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed. Talk about dropping a mic and exiting stage left, right? <laughs> like, Wow, what a statement. Elijah says in so many words, even though you didn't consider what the Lord had to say, I'm about to tell you in this moment. The Amplified Version reads this way. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You, Ahijah, will not leave the bed on which you lie, but you will certainly die. <laughs> in other words, you are going to die, cease to have life, in the exact same condition that you are currently in. <laughs> so in closing, this king experienced pain, injury, damage. This fall weakened his physical condition. It completely took away his mobility. It affected him so much so that he is unable to effectively and efficiently do what his position requires of him. How can you maintain a kingdom from your bed? <laughs> How can you lead the people in battle if you are disabled yourself? This injury affected his ability to operate as king. Yet instead of going to the one who allowed him to be king, he doesn't even consider seeking the king of kings. He chooses to go to another source, another God, another resource to find out whether or not he will ever be restored to health. Now, if you learn nothing else from this lesson, I need it to be clear that if you take your pain, your injury, your wounds to anyone else, but to the ultimate doctor, the ultimate healer, your creator, then you will not recover. You will die. You will cease to have life in the exact same condition that you are in now. Because you are looking to someone and or something. You're looking for them to provide you with information, with strategy, with resources concerning your injury that has no ability to really restore you to health. So, if you really want to be made whole, take your injuries to Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. I love you all to life, and I wish you a fabulous day.